Now today we're in chapter 27 and we're going to go into chapter 28 here in the book of Ezekiel. And I should begin by telling you this is going to be very difficult because I feel like I'm rushing through chapter 27. But in reality, as you look at chapter 27, you can see that it really pretty much speaks for itself. And so what I'll do in chapter 27 is I'll read several verses and just touch on a few things as we move our way into chapter 28. And uh, in chapter 28, we're going to spend uh, the majority of the last portion of our time looking at, uh, at, uh, at Satan. Not that we really want to, frankly, but um, because we find uh, that uh, Ezekiel speaks a word that gives to us a sense that relates to the, uh, the origin of Satan in terms of um, some of the initial things that you see concerning him in Scripture. We'll see that in chapter 28. So let's begin reading together in Ezekiel chapter 27. We'll look at verses 1 through 7 and get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 27, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Now, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyre, and say to Tyre, You who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples on many coastlands, thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the midst of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They made all your planks of fir trees from Sinir. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make you a mast. Of oaks from Bashan, they made your oars. The company of Asherites have inlaid your planks with ivory from the coast of Cyprus. Fine embroidered linen from Egypt was what you spread for your sail. Blue and purple from the coast of Elisha was what covered you. Now, as we look at this, uh, again, we need to notice that the Lord speaks, and notice in verse 2, he says, uh, take up a lamentation for Tyre. And so what we have here, again, in chapter 27 is what is called a song of sorrow. It's a song of mourning. And it's a song of sorrow for the great and beautiful city, the ancient city of Tyre. Now, the ancient city of Tyre was located on the coast of the Mediterranean in what is today modern Lebanon. And during the time of Ezekiel, Tyre was, was known for its beauty as well as its wealth. And so what we have here is Ezekiel giving a lamentation, and what he does is he describes her beauty for us, and he also speaks concerning those that she traded with. This is a song of sorrow because God's heart is always broken when the ungodly are punished. And I find it interesting to note that, and I will present that briefly that very often when, when the evil are, are punished, we, we very often say, well, they got what they had coming. And, and in many, many cases, maybe they should have gotten worse than they, than they got, to be honest with you. But that doesn't mean that God rejoices over the death of the wicked. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33 says, he does not afflict willingly. It's not that God wants to destroy, it's that God is moved into having to judge and having to deal with these things, and that's what's happening here. It's not that God rejoices in punishing, it's not that God rejoices in the destruction of this city and all, it's, it's that they deserve it, it's, it's that they have reaped now what they have been sowing, and that's what he's speaking about here. Now, in this passage here, what you have is, is this, this city of Tyre that is pictured as a great trade ship, a great trade ship that is destroyed on the high seas. She's described as being perfectly beautiful. This ship has custom decks, expensive wood from Lebanon. It has the best craftsmen. And everything that you see about her is absolutely beautiful. She has ivory, embroidered linen, beautiful colors. And so you see this great trade ship that's being described here as a, a custom ship. But in verse 8, it says, Inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad were your, your oarsmen, your wise men, O Tyre, were in you. They became your pilots. Elders of Gabal and its wise men were, uh, were in you to caulk your seams. All the ships of the sea and their oarsmen were in you to market your merchandise. Those from Persia, Lydia, which would be modern Turkey, and Libya were in your army as men of war. They were mercenaries. They hung shields and helmet in you, meaning that they were ready to fight at any time. They gave splendor to you. Men of Arvad with your army were on your walls all around. 
And the men of Gamad, that word Gamad speaks of valiant or warriors, valiant men, were in your towers. They hung their shields on your walls all around. They made you be your beauty perfect. So he's describing those who were involved in the life of this city. She was a cosmopolitan city. She was international in her flavor. People from everywhere were involved in her culture. He, he mentioned Sidon and Arvad, Gaval. These are various uh, cities, locations, countries. Those from Persia and Lydia and Libya were in her army as men of war. And so she was a very cosmopolitan, very beautiful, very extravagant city. And that's basically what he's saying here. But he goes on in verse 12 and he says, Tarshish was your merchant because, your, because of your many luxury goods. They gave you silver, iron, tin, and lead for your goods. Javan, Tabal, and Meshech were your traders. They bartered human lives for vessels of bronze for your merchandise. Those from the house of uh, Tagarma, or Armenia, traded for your wares with horses, steeds, and mules. The men of Dedan were your traders. Many isles were the market of your hand. They brought you ivory tusks, and ebony as payment. Syria was your merchant because of the abundance of goods you made. They gave you for your wares emeralds, purple, embroidery, fine linen, corals, and rubies. Judah and the land of Israel were your traders. They traded for your merchandise, wheat of minute, millet, honey, oil, and balm. Damascus was your merchant because of the abundance of goods you made, because of your many luxury items, with the wine of, of Helvan and with white wool. Dan and Javan paid for your wares, traversing back and forth. Rod iron, cassia, and cane were among your merchandise. Dedan was your merchant in saddlecloths for riding. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar were your regular merchants. They traded with you in lambs, rams, and goats. The merchants of Sheba and Ramah were your merchants. They traded for all your wares, the choicest spices, all kinds of precious stones and gold, Haran, Kana, Eden, and merchants of Sheba, Assyria, and Kilmad were your merchants. These were your merchants in choice items, in purple clothes, embroidered garments, chests of multicolored apparel, in sturdy woven cords, which were in your marketplace. And so all of this is just describing how, she, how Tyre traded with many countries. Uh, she traded with a variety. Verse 12, Tarshish is the name of ancient Spain. So this gives to you the insight that this was somebody who had an international trade going on. Javan is the Greek Isles. Tabal and Meshach is up in the north. It could be in ancient Russia. As I mentioned, Tagarmo is Armenia. And, and the, the Haran and Kana, Ed, Eden, and all were located in southern, southern Iraq, and Sheba was in Arabia. So this just gives you an insight into all the various places that you had uh, merchandise uh, agreements trade with. And, and so he's just presenting what an incredible cosmopolitan city she was. Verse 25, the ships of Tarshish were carriers of your merchandise. You were filled and very glorious in the midst of the seas. Your oarsmen brought you into many waters but the east wind broke you in the midst of the seas. Your riches, wares, and merchandise, your mariners and pilots, your caulkers and merchandisers, all your men of war who are in you, and the entire company which is in your midst will fall into the midst of the seas on the day of your ruin. You're beautiful and you're powerful, but as beautiful and powerful as you are, you will be brought down to nothing. How's that going to happen? Verse 26 speaks of your oarsmen. The oarsmen would be those who are guiding you or bringing you to a destination. They're your leaders. And what is happening is, Tyre, your leaders have brought you to a place where you will be judged. And verse 27 is a picture of complete ruin. Your ruin is going to be absolutely complete. The entire company which is in your midst will fall into the midst of the seas on the day of your ruin. So all of this speaking concerning the beauty and all that she possessed, how she had tremendous flavor. She was a wonderful, beautiful city in every way. But God says your leadership, the leadership of your, your city has brought you into ruin. You will be completely destroyed. Verse 28, the common land will shake at the sound of the cry of your pilots. 
all who handle the oar, the mariners, all the pilots of the sea will come down from their ships and stand on the shore. They will make their voice heard because of you. They will cry bitterly and cast dust on their heads. They will roll about in ashes. They'll shave themselves completely bald because of you, gird themselves with sackcloth and weep for you with bitterness of heart and bitter wailing. In their wailing for you, they will take up a lamentation and lament for you. What city is like Tyre, destroyed in the midst of the sea? The mariners or the pilots are going to be completely shaken by what happens to you. And those who were profiting by trade with you are going to be in dismay. Your destruction is going to cause many people to feel terrible. But he goes on to say, when your, your wares went out by sea, you satisfied many people. You enriched the kings of the earth with many luxury goods and your merchandise. But you are broken by the seas in the depths of the waters. Your merchandise and the entire company will fall in your midst. All the inhabitants of the isles will be astonished at you. Their kings will be greatly afraid. Their countenance will be troubled. The merchants among you, among the peoples, will hiss at you. You will become a whore and be no more forever. Now, you're going to be totally destroyed. But your destruction doesn't affect everyone equally. Some of the people who see you destroyed are actually going to rejoice at your destruction. Verse 36 uh, seems to indicate that merchants who are hissing at you are going to actually have malicious joy at the destruction of Tyre. And so what he's pointing to here very briefly is the obvious lesson is riches without God cannot satisfy the heart of man. Tyre had everything going for her as a city, and yet there was no satisfaction in her. And ultimately, because she didn't pursue God and her leadership took her away from pursuing God, she ultimately was judged. And moving into chapter 28, I told you it would only take a minute to go through chapter 27. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into the, your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you've increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. So now we move into chapter 28, and, and let's begin by saying this. This section primarily speaks of a human prince who's also referred to later on as a king, the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre, that is actually being used by Satan. You see, when you first see it, 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 it speaks to him as a prince, but later on it speaks to him as a king. And all you need to know is this, is that in the Old Testament, sometimes the word prince and sometimes the word king are, are interchangeable. They speak of the same office. We'll see that in chapter 37, verses 24 and 25. And so what we find here in chapter 28 principally is that, that this text is speaking of God's judgment on the king, but it also, as we'll see in a moment, applies to Satan. Now, the, the prince that's being spoken of, the king that is being spoken of here, for those who take notes, is, is, a, is named Itto Baal, I-T-T-O-B-A-A-L, the second, as if you needed more than one. And the date is just before Nebuchadnezzar laid siege on, on uh, Tyre, which was in 585 to 573. And so what you have here is you have a, 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 a word against this prince, against this king. Now, this king has, has many sins, but I want you to notice that, that there are three things that are principally spoken of concerning uh, this king. One, it says in verse uh, 2, you say, I am a god. And, and secondly, in verse 3, you are wiser than Daniel. And then in verse 4, you've gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasury. So he's basically dealing with him for three basic things. One, as many ancient kings, this particular king claimed to have descent from gods. 
When you look in the, uh, into history and you look into the religious beliefs and, and, and practices of many ancient peoples, you'll discover that many of them claim descent from gods. And so this one, this, this prince is claiming that he is a direct descendant of the gods. And so God speaks to him and says, you say that you're a, a god, but in reality you're simply a man. The second thing he points to is the arrogance of his, his pride. He claims to be the most wise. And so because he claims to be the most wise, behold, you are wise, he says, you're wiser than Daniel. He uses Daniel as an example, as sarcasm against him. And then three, he's extremely rich. And because he's extremely rich, he believes that he has need of nothing and he's extremely proud because of it. Now, as is common with all human beings, these are the things that, that man looks for. Man, man desires these kinds of things for themselves. He wants to be regarded as being good. He wants to be somebody who is regarded as being wise. And he most certainly wants to be somebody who has riches. It's common in man. And, and what has happened here is this has caused this person to be arrogantly proud. Because he didn't have that which he needed the most. He had a wisdom. There's no doubt about it. He had something about him that people admired. And this man was extremely rich. And those are the things that people want to have. It's interesting how Jeremiah in chapter 9, verse 23 and 24 said it this way. He said, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight. If you're going to be boasting, boast about your understanding of me. If you're going to be boasting, boast about your relationship with me. Boast in this sense that you know and understand my ways. What is it that people are taught when they're small growing up? What was I taught? In one form or another, I was taught well, what you need to do is you need to take care of your health because if you take care of your health, it's a way for you to attain wealth. So health and wealth were very important. And one of the sources to have wealth was to have education. And so the things that you're basically raised with are an encouragement to education, an encouragement to take care of your body, and an encouragement to go out and make some money. That's basically what Americans are driven by. Those are the things that most Americans look for. Health, wealth, education, those are things that we consider to be extremely important to the point that sometimes those wishes, desires, and the pursuit of those things end up displacing our relationship with God. And God is making it very clear. He's saying to the king, the prince of Tyre, he's saying, you, you are very arrogant. You're very powerful. You're very wealthy. You claim descent from being God. You think that you're better than the average person. You're wiser than the average person. And undoubtedly, you are richer than the average person. In other words, you've got everything going for you that the average person wishes they had. Speak to some of the young people today, and what is it that many people want? And it doesn't have to be a young person either. It can be older people. It doesn't really matter. What would you like to have? Well, it would be good if I had an education. It would be good if my health remained strong. It would be good if I was able to make a lot of money. If I was able to, you know, have somebody come over with the, you know, and give me a check for a million dollars, I wouldn't mind that. You know, and, and, and what we want is we want to have these things. We want these things because many times they're proof that we are valuable, that we mean something. And God says, listen, the thing that matters is whether you know and understand me. When all things are said and done, when you stand before God, he's not going to ask you how educated were you. He's not going to ask you how much could you bench press. He's not going to ask you, you know, how much money did you have. None of those things are going to count at all when I stand before God. The one thing that's going to matter when I stand before God in judgment is, did you know and understand me? Did you have a relationship with me? That's what matters. Not whether I had a large amount of money in my bank account, not whether I had multiple letters behind my name, you know, Bachelor of Arts, Master of Divinity, PhD. Those things are not the things that are going to make God welcome me into the kingdom. And that's what God is saying. Unfortunately for the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, for him, these things mattered the most. And God is saying they don't matter at all. Because ultimately what matters is whether you know me and, and you did not know me. And, and what happened is you became arrogantly proud. And as a result of that, you're being judged. Proverbs 3:34. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. And so God is speaking here to the prince of Tyre. He says, you're a man, not a God. Though you say your heart is the heart of a God, you're just a man. 
You're only a human being and you're going to go the way of the world, the way that all human beings go. It's appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. And ultimately, you're going to stand before God. In verse 6, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit. You shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I'm a God? But you shall be a man and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised. You're going to die the death of an unbeliever by the hand of aliens. For I've spoken, says the Lord God. You know, everybody is the bravest in the world when they're in perfect security and comfort. You can be on your throne, he's saying to this prince, and he's saying, and on that throne, you present yourself as the wisest, most powerful, richest, claim descent from God. But when the man who's going to kill you is standing before you, and he has that sword in his hand, and you say to him, I'm a God, do you think that's going to help you at all at that time? Well, the answer, obviously, is it's not going to help you at all. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to die like any man dies because you're not a God. And it's the Babylonians who are going to kill you. Now, though the Babylonians are going to come in and they're going to kill you, fact is, I really am the one who's your executioner. That's what he's saying in verse 10 when he says, For I have spoken, says the Lord God, though you will die at the hand of foreigners, aliens will enter in, Babylonians, and later in the history of Tyre, uh, Greece will come in and complete the destruction. Though you're going to die at the hand of aliens, he, he's saying, I'm the one who has spoken this. In other words, I'm the one who brings judgment. Daniel 5.23 speaks of the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways. And what God is simply saying to him is you can, you can stand up there and you can arrogantly boast all day long about your, your wisdom and your riches and your supposed descent, but ultimately you are going to be brought to judgment. And those who come against you are going to actually execute judgment because I'm going to appoint them to do that against you. You have no power and you have no authority. You have no capacity to resist because it's me, God, who's bringing judgment against you. Now, as all of this is being said, we move into some very interesting verses here, beginning at verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God, You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground... I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. This message here obviously goes beyond the king of Tyre. This message is directed towards the one who inspired arrogance and the evil of that king. There's an application here for the king, but this is also a reference to the fall of Satan. Now, this isn't the only place that a king is referred to in this way. If you take notes, you can see that also in Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, when God spoke that way to the king of Babylon. Now, what we have here, and I'm going to look at this with you in a little detail, 
When he says in verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seed of perfection. No, he is speaking to the king of Tyre. He's actually speaking to the power behind the throne. This isn't the only place in Scripture where God is speaking to Satan, though he's addressing somebody else. In, in Matthew chapter 16, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking concerning the fact that he's going to, going to build his church and all, and, and then he goes into the, the fact that he's going to be uh, taken, he's going to be betrayed, taken, he's going to be crucified, he's going to die, he's going to be buried and resurrected. Remember with me how the apostle Peter at that point says, God forbid that this should take place. And the Lord Jesus begins to speak to the apostle Peter, and, and, and Jesus turns and says to him, uh, says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, quite obviously, he wasn't saying at that time that, that the apostle Peter had become Satan. What Jesus was speaking concerning was the motivation behind Peter's resistance to him going to the cross. That motivation, that resistance didn't come from the inside of, of the apostle Peter. That motivation came from Satan himself. And that's why Jesus spoke to him in that way and said, get thee behind me, Satan. In, in Genesis, in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, uh, the Bible says, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head you shall, and you shall bruise his heel. He's speaking to a serpent who was used by Satan, but he's directly speaking to Satan. And so there are times in Scripture where you'll see God speaking to the motivation behind He's speaking to Satan both the, the time that he spoke to the serpent and the time that he was speaking to the apostle Peter. And that's what you have here. So you see this king in his pride and his arrogance is going to receive judgment even as did Satan. Satan himself likened himself to God and he was judged for it. And even as he was judged for it, so will the king of Tyre be judged. And so God is speaking not only to the king, but he's speaking to the power behind the throne. He's speaking to Satan. He's speaking to the devil. Now, some don't even believe that there's such a thing as a personal devil. There are those today in our, in our generation who relate better to a principle of evil. I'll speak concerning a principle of evil. Oh, yes, there's a certain principle of evil that exists in the world, but I do not believe in a, an actual personal devil. There's a principle, but not a personal devil. There's a principle of evil, but not a personal devil. Some will say, well, there's no real devil. What, what you have is en uh, negative energy of some sort because they don't want to, to admit that there may very well be a, a devil, a, a personal Satan, a personal Lucifer. Somebody once wrote, men don't believe in a devil now as their fathers used to do. They force the door of the broadest creed to let his majesty through. There isn't a print of his cloven foot or a fiery dart from his bow to be found in earth or air today, for the world has voted it so. But who is mixing the fatal draft that palsies heart and brain and loads the earth of each passing year with 10,000 slain? Who blights the bloom of the land today with the fiery breath of hell? If the devil isn't and never was, won't so somebody rise and tell? A personal devil. The personal devil, this unseen power, is known by various titles and various names in the Bible. When you study the Bible, you'll discover that there are no less than 40 names and titles that are used in reference to the devil. He's called Abaddon, which means ruin. He's called the accuser, the adversary. Apollyon, which means destroyer. He's called Beelzebub, which means lord of dung. He is Belial, which means worthless. He's the devil, who is a slanderer. He is the dragon. He's the god of this age. He's referred to as a murderer, prince of demons, prince of the power of the air. He's the ruler of darkness, the ruler of this world. He's referred to as Satan, the adversary, the serpent, and the wicked one. He's also known as Lucifer. The word Lucifer means light bearer or shining one. It's also translated morning star. And there are two passages that you find in the Old Testament that seem to indicate his origin. You have here Ezekiel chapter 28, and you have Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. And so as we look at this, he's not speaking simply to the king of Tyre. 
He's speaking to something greater than the king of Tyre. He's speaking to the one who motivates the king of Tyre to his arrogance and pride. He's speaking to Satan. And notice how he begins in verse 12 when he says to him, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. The seal of perfection. You were created perfect in angelic beauty. You were perfect before you rebelled against God. And as an angel, you had great wisdom and you were beautiful in your appearance. It's interesting when you look at medieval art that those who would uh, draw characters of, the, of Satan or Lucifer normally made him to look, in, uh, you know, in a very grotesque and very ugly uh, manner. And the reason that they did that is because they wanted to reveal in their artwork the evil, corrupt nature of Satan. But the Bible doesn't teach that he was, that he was uh, evil in terms of, uh, rather ugly in terms of his appearance. The Bible says that he had a beauty to him. And there is something called the beautiful side or the beautiful appearance of evil. Satan has a beauty to him. Satan had a beauty when he was created. There is something appealing about him and there is something appealing about evil. If we could see evil for what it is with all its corruptness and all of its ugliness, we would not be attracted to it. But there's a beautiful side to it that causes us to want it, to desire it. As we see it, we desire and crave for it. We long after it. And there's something within our nature that drives us to pursue that. We know that it's wrong. We know that it can end up with our hurt. And yet there's something about it that draws us to it. There's a beautiful side of evil. And as uh, the devil is being described here, he says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. There was something about you in your initial creation that made you absolutely gorgeous. He says in verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you in the day you were created. Now, as he speaks concerning this, notice you were in Eden, the garden of God. Of course, it could refer to the king's lush living arrangements, how beautiful they were. Yet Satan did come into the garden of Eden, and that's where Satan introduced sin to humanity. He speaks of every precious stone being his covering and names nine stones. The stones are intended to, to demonstrate the beauty of Satan. But when you look at this, notice with me there are nine stones that are listed here. These nine stones are nine of the 12 stones on the high priest's breastplate that you see in Exodus 28. And so what this is intended to do is signify the beauty and glory that was bestowed on him. Now, he says in verse 13 into verse 14, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, when he says the workmanship of your timbrels, the word timbrel is tambourines. Pipes would be uh, uh, like the pan flutes. It's a row of, of wooden hollowed out reeds that had holes placed into them that they would use as a flute. And so what he's saying here, and I find this really interesting, is that as the anointed cherub, you had special prominence amongst all of the angels. Satan, it would appear, because these are musical instruments that are being described, timbrels and pipes. He was the worship leader in heaven. I was teaching at a worship conference, worship leaders conference, and uh, I quoted something from um, J. Vernon McGee. I said, when Satan was kicked out of heaven, he fell into the choir loft. Satan, and we're going to see this. I'm afraid I'm getting ahead of my notes, but so be it. Satan led worship. He led the angels in worship of God. He had the premier spot in heaven. He was the covering cherub. The cherubim are a, uh, an order of angels that are intended to guard the holiness of God. 
Satan had access to God, access to the throne room, and he also had leadership for the worship and praise of God. Job 38, verse 7 speaks of when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God, speaking of angels, shouted for joy. There are heavenly choirs. And you can see it in the book of Revelation where there are heavenly choirs. Angels and men, the redeemed, sing songs of praise, the songs of the redeemed and all men sing. And you see that heaven is filled with worship and praise. That's one of the reasons why I've said on occasion, if, if people don't like to worship the Lord in song in church, heaven's not the place for them because heaven is filled with worship. And from the beginning, when God created Satan, actually called Lucifer, when God created him, this was the one who was the covering cherub. He was the one who was intended by God to be the one, in, in a way, in a sense, to, to, to be protecting, if you will, the holiness of God. He had access to God. He would lead the heavenly choir in worship and praise. That's what he did. There is something about having power and authority to get people to sing and everything, to get them to move to get them to respond to your voice, to the way that you're acting, the things that you're doing. There's something that is so powerful. It's almost like a narcotic. It is such a strong drug that sometimes when people get into worship ministry and they begin to lead worship and they're supposed to be leading people into the presence of God, there is something about it that can cause people who are in that position to begin to desire to have the adulation, not so much the worship because they don't even recognize that's what they're wanting, but the attention. They want to hear from people how good they sing, how beautifully they play. It's a dangerous place to be if you're not called by God to that ministry. Because what happens is people get drawn because of the attention. People walk up to them afterwards and they speak to them. And they tell them, your voice is absolutely beautiful. I love the way you play that instrument. It's just something about the way you lead. And if that person doesn't die to themselves, they can begin to steal the glory from God. It's not that hard to do. A long time ago, I learned as a minister that there are times that the Lord may have a special moment in a Bible study that people actually get touched by. And somebody will approach and say, that was the greatest message I've ever heard. You just smile. Really? Come next week, it'll be terrible. You never believe all the good, and you never believe all the bad. It's usually somewhere in the middle. But you certainly don't stand up to, to lead. You don't stand up there to teach. You don't do that in order to be admired. You do that because you have to do that. It's your calling. It's what, it, it's what fulfills you as a believer, but it's your calling to do that because as a worship leader, you are bringing people into the presence of God. You are encouraging them to know Jesus Christ. So you have to stay out of the way so they can see him. And when people walk out saying, I wish I could play an instrument like that or sing like that, they didn't really see the Lord. They saw the instrument. And you have to be careful. You have to be careful that you don't covet that. You have to be careful that you don't desire that because that's exactly what happened to Satan. He was the heavenly worship leader. He was the choir director. And he saw what was going on and he desired it for himself. God says in verse 15 following, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings. Sometimes people think that Satan and God are equal. That's not true at all. God is uncreated and Satan is created. He was one of the angels that were created by God. And that makes him a creature and not the creator, and therefore he is not as great as that one who created but sometimes they think that his power, they think that his power is almost equal to God. His power is infinitely less than God's. 
He's a created being. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have tremendous power and influence. Indeed, he does. And he uses it to cause people to, to, to fall away from or stay away from God. And so this is one here that is being spoken of that's got to be more than just this king of Tyre. It has to be somebody that, that is beyond that. And this has to be speaking of, of Satan. Notice how it says in verse 15, now, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. No man is born with a sinless nature. From Adam, we all human beings, all human beings outside of Jesus in his humanity, all human beings other than Jesus have a sin nature. But when God created the angels, they were created perfect. And so he's speaking to Satan. And Satan was created with perfection. But he says, iniquity was found in you. That word iniquity is unrighteousness. It speaks of perversity. In verse 16, the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence. In other words, Satan, you influenced the king. His commercial success was accompanied by violence. But, he says in verse 16 and 17, you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. What did you do? Well, verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom. Now, God speaks concerning this iniquity that was found. What was the iniquity discovered in Lucifer? Well, Paul makes reference to that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. He said, being puffed up with pride, he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. Puffed up with pride. And so, what is the condemnation? What is the judgment? It comes because of the pride. You became arrogant. In arrogant pride, Lucifer desired the worship that is given only to God. He was corrupted by his own beauty, corrupted by his own wisdom, and he equated himself to God. Now, in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, when God is speaking to him, he says, You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This has been called the five I wills of Satan. Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. In other words, I will preside over the angels. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation. I'm going to be worshipped in the temple. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. In other words, I will reach heights unattainable to anyone else. And then he said, I will be like the Most High. So I'm going to have these things. I'm going to be like God. I will be worshipped. But God says in verse 17, I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Satan, as much as you declare that you would, have my holiness, have my worship. I'm the one who cast you to the ground. It's interesting how Satan was cast out of heaven. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus later would say, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You're going to be a spectacle to other kings. You're going to be mocked by others. Satan. He hates you. And a lot of us in this room tonight don't believe that. He hates you. He hates you more than he hates almost anything. He hates you. He wants to destroy you. You see... The enemy has a tendency of trying to deceive and control, to manipulate, to destroy. That's what he does. But he makes promises. Beautiful side of evil, he makes promises. He tells you, if you drink this thing, it's going to fulfill you. If you eat this, you'll be satisfied. If you wear that, everybody will like you. If you attain this, you're going to be respected. If you get this education, you're going to have a lot of doors opening to you. 
He wants to lead you not based on you trusting and following God, but by putting a carrot in front of you and, and drawing you according to your own lusts away from the things that God might be doing that might not make sense at that moment. Satan loves to convince you that God hates you. He loves to convince you that God is tired of you. He likes to convince you that there's no hope for you. He likes to convince you that there's no way that you could ever be saved. He whispers in your ear. He whispers in your ear. He distracts you in a variety of ways because he doesn't want you hearing the voice of God. So he's constantly got you moving from one thing to another, always unsatisfied, attempting to get you to seek satisfaction in everything except what God can do for you. Jesus said, if a man drinks this water, he will thirst again. But if he drinks of the water that I give to him, he's going to have, a, uh, he's going to have an artesian well that explodes from him. He'll never thirst again. He said, when you eat of my flesh, you'll never hunger again. When you drink of my blood, you'll never thirst again. Because when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, everything that matters is suddenly made very clear. It's a relationship with God. It's a fulfillment. It's a power of the Holy Spirit. It's joy. It's peace. It's love. It's, it's a variety of things that you can't buy or get in any other way. But the enemy wants to make you believe that, that he can give you the things that you desire, when in reality what he does is he makes promises that he can't keep so that he might see you destroyed even as he's one day going to be cast into that, that fiery lake and will remain there for eternity. He wants you to be there with him. God, on the other hand, wants you to be with him. And so you have this cosmic battle over men's souls. Satan presents himself as being equal to God, even greater in many ways. And uh, in reality, like Jesus said, he's a liar, he's the father of lies. There's no way that he can give to you the things that he promises. Ultimately, what happens is God says, I cast you out because you're nothing. You, 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 you act as if you're something, you act as if you're powerful, but in reality, you're nothing. You're simply going to end up a spectacle. You see, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15, God says, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. You see, pride always results in a fall. And both Satan and this king were brought down by pride. It's been said, nothing is less like God than prideful aspirations to be the equal of God. And so Satan is a created being who is the power behind the throne of the king of Tyre. God addresses the power behind the throne, but he's speaking to Satan, but it can apply to the king. The king, too, was arrogant, thought he was a god, thought that he was wealthy beyond ever losing any of that. But ultimately what happens is God says, no, you're a man and you're going to die like a man. And then he speaks to the power behind him. He says, you, too, will be destroyed. You, too, will be judged. Notice in verse 18, you defied you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Your pride and your evil is the cause of the judgment that is coming, he speaks to the king of Tyre. Tyre was known for numerous temples, and God says they're all going to be destroyed. I'm bringing judgment on you, and I'm bringing judgment on them, and they will all be consumed. Finally, one last thought. Satan said, I will be like the Most High, and he tried to take it for himself. Jesus never aspired to greatness because he didn't have to. Jesus is God in human flesh and therefore did not act in pride because Jesus is a servant of all. And when Paul was writing in the book of Philippians in chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, this is what he said. He said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, 
taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. That's what's going to take place. Jesus himself, Jesus didn't have to grasp after godliness because Jesus is God in the flesh. Satan grasped after it. He tried to take it for himself. It is Jesus. Uh, it, is, it belongs to Jesus because Jesus already is God. And because Jesus Christ didn't come and try and take something because it was already his, Jesus voluntarily took upon himself something the form of a servant who became a bondservant for us in order that he might die and take our place on that cross. But ultimately what happens is Jesus has a name that is above all names. The enemy, Satan, wants to be worshipped as God. Jesus Christ is worshipped as God. And that's why every knee shall bow. That's why every tongue shall confess. See, the thing that, that, that I get driven by is, is, in, is the desire to see that that at least every person that comes to this fellowship understands that, that every person that, that at least in this church here, uh, understands that, that you will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, some are going to willingly do that. I will willingly do that. I have done that since I got saved. Jesus is Lord. And, and I confess him as my Lord because he is my Lord. And so when I see him face to face as I stand before him, I will recognize him. I will know him. Though I have never seen him, like the apostle Peter said, yet I love him. And when I do finally see him, I see the one who wept for me, the one who died for me. I will recognize him because I've been spending most of my life trying to get to know him. So when I see him face to face, I will have the opportunity to recognize him. I will bow before him, and I will declare him my Lord. And I will say it like that, you are my Lord. And indeed he is. There are others who will declare him to be Lord, but they're not going to say it with the same kind of heart that we will because we say he is Lord because he is. They'll say he is Lord. It's a surprise to them. It's going to be an acknowledgement. They're going to be basically forced into acknowledging that when they see him as what he is. And everybody will do that. Muhammad will do that. Buddha will do that. Freud will do that. All who denied him will ultimately look, look him in the face and say, you are the Lord. That's what's going to take place. That's what the Bible just said in Philippians 2. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Jesus Christ is Lord. So I do that here. I do that every day when I pray. And I say, Lord, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my Lord. I do that every day. I do it often, so do you, when we speak to him. We're just getting in practice because the day's going to come when you look him face to face and you're finally going to be able to say to him, Jesus, I love you. I've rehearsed. I've been rehearsing now for a long time what I hope to be able to see, say when I see him. And it's not really profound. You see, because some, sometimes when I, especially when I was first saved, people were saying, oh, I can hardly wait to go to heaven because I want to see Paul because I want to ask him some questions about some of the things that he wrote. And I would hear people say that. And others would say, well, I'd like to spend some time with the Apostle Peter because, you know, this guy reminds me of myself. He was always doing something very stupid, and so I identify with him. <laughs> and I heard that as I was growing up and, and in the Lord. And, 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 and I've always been one who said, has said, you know what, that's cool, man. You need to talk to Paul. That'd be cool. And you really ought to spend some, some time talking to the Apostle Peter. That would be really good. But I said that because if they're spending time with Paul, that gives me more time with Jesus. <laughs> you know, so spend your time with them. That's cool. Enjoy them. Go and, you know, 400 years with them because that gives me more opportunity to talk to and be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I'm serious when I say this. I, 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 when I first got saved, I began to think, I wonder what I will say to the Lord 
when I first see him. Yes, I will confess he's Lord, but what will I say to him? And, and it's boiled down to this. This is basically what I'm going to do. I, 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 I pray that, I, uh, that this is true. I pray that this is what, what can happen. I, I, I only have a couple things I want to say to him when I see him for the very first time. I, I, I want to say, first, I want to say to him, I love you. And, and secondly, I want to say thank you. That's it. I love you and thank you. I love you for what you've done for me. Look where I am. I'll be in heaven, man. Look where I am. And I want to thank you. That's all I really want to say to him. And I have this belief that he'll smile at me, and that'll be pretty much it. <laughs> that'll be pretty much it. That's all I need, just a smile from the Lord. Just a smile from the Lord. Satan is my enemy. I don't want to give in to his deceitful tactics. I lived under his authority for too long, and he ruined my life, and he used me to ruin other people. I was in Pacific Grove in 1971, in March of 1971, and a friend of mine named Paul had moved there from Whittier. Two friends and I drove from Norwalk to Pacific Grove up north by Monterey to go visit my friend. I had just gotten saved, and I wanted to tell Paul about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we went to his apartment, and when we got there, Paul said, wait a minute, before we start visiting and all, he says, I invited some of my friends to come and meet you guys. Paul and I had been friends in high school, so I remember sitting there in his front room, and uh, two or three guys showed up, and they came walking into the house, and they sat down there on the couch, and I was sitting here with a couple of my friends, and Paul and his three friends were across from us. And my friend Paul said something I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten this. It's been almost 39 years. He turned to his friends, and he said, This is David. He said, David got me loaded for the very first time. And I've never forgotten how that felt. It felt like a sword was piercing me. This is my friend David. He got me loaded for the very first time. And after he introduced me that way, I said, you know, Paul, and for that I'm sorry, but I came to bring something else to you this time. I came to bring the word of life. That Jesus Christ has saved me, Paul. And I came up here just to let you know that he loves you and he can save you too. And I have never forgotten because I do not want to be used by Satan ever again. I want to be used by the Lord to bring people to Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line.